I had this feeling that Samoa was about to sink any second. You saw it on TV and you thought it's never going to happen in real life, but it did. There was a need to teach people new skills that were affected by the tsunami and then the closure of our canneries here. At that time, we're kind of grabbing at anything that tends to have some indication of hope. And NEG was one of those when it was brought to my attention. More than 2,500 miles southwest of Hawaii and almost 5,000 miles from the U.S. mainland lies the U.S. territory, American Samoa. It's closer to New Zealand than to Hawaii, the only U.S. territory south of the equator. Its location and history have created an island culture that is part Polynesian and part Main Street, USA. The biggest island Tutuila is about the size of Washington, D.C. The island's 67,000 residents are spread among dozens of villages, none of them larger than a few thousand. It's a place unlike any other. It's further away from the continent than any other U.S. territory and yet has strong ties to the mainland. Hundreds of thousands of Samoans have settled in the U.S. and thousands have served in the U.S. military. Among the island's key assets are its remarkable naturally sheltered deepwater port, the largest in the South Pacific, and its proximity to abundant fishing grounds. That's what made it the preeminent fish processing hub in the area. Two major processing plants, Chicken of the Sea and Starkist, became the two largest employers on the island by 1990s. In 2005, the canneries directly employed over 4,500 people, more than one in four workers on the island. Nearly one in two jobs was directly or indirectly dependent on the fish processing industry. To this day, it is the only major export product from the islands. On September 29, 2009, an earthquake measuring 8.1 on the Richter scale struck an underwater region only 125 miles from the island. I felt like I was floating and that land was like paper. I had this feeling that Samoa was about to sink any second. The quake was so close that there was little time to warn residents in low-lying areas of the danger that lay ahead. I didn't worry a little bit because we have quite few earthquakes here, you know. But when it lasted uh, over a minute, what came to my mind is was that uh, there could be a tsunami after this. Only 25 minutes later, villagers observed the water receding along the coastline and that is when most residents realized that a tsunami was about to strike. I saw the coral reefs being exposed like they weren't before. I was very scared at the moment. I realized at the time that there's no way that we can leave. 34 people lost their lives that day. Many more were injured. Some were dragged out to sea and swept back on land and survived miraculously. My experience, uh, I can't put it into words, but I thought it was going to be the end of the world. I saw it was a terrifying experience looking at people's house. No matter how man-made did it, it was just the ocean that just wiped it clean. You saw it on TV and you thought you never, it's never going to happen in real life. But it did. It was horrible. You know, just seeing all the debris on everything, houses, cars, you know, and then hearing that, you know, some of our relatives were affected by the tsunami and died from it. So that was really bad. The waves coming in and it's going out with lots of stuff. Looks like they're gathering all the stuff. So we, all we're doing upstairs is just crying. All we're just crying and crying. 
The ancient Samoan tradition of Fa Samoa, taking care of the extended family, the village and the community, was tested on that day and every day since. Cleanup began almost immediately. Heavy equipment is very limited on the island, so most of it was done manually by residents. They came out to help by the thousands. The Samoan culture is centered on respect for one another. And out of that respect, you express your love and support uh, when something happens to one family, everybody gravitates to that family to lend assistance with no hesitation and without being asked to come and help. That's the way we lived. When it happened, I was in Honolulu. So the following morning, I arrived on a Coast Guard plane. And as I toured the island, that morning I arrived, I saw that in just about every village that was stricken. I saw people among us from other villages that were there working to clear up the debris. I saw people from other villages helping to look for people that were still missing. The whole village is a whole family. And everybody was pitching in and cleaning up. Even uh, people that live up in the, in the hills who, were, who did not have anything damaged, they were all down, uh, coming down to the uh, flat part of the uh, village and uh, we, we all worked together. Nothing that I know in my lifetime could demonstrate better the value of family connection as the tsunami of 2009 became obvious that the resilience of the Samoans is due to the fact that they come together during times of extreme crisis. And this was one of those times. It was clear that basic cleanup would take weeks and restoring the infrastructure months. That would only be possible with outside help. One source of help was the U.S. Department of Labor, which awarded the island a National Emergency Grant, or NEG. At that time, we're kind of grabbing at anything that, you know, tends to have some indication of hope. And NEG was one of those when it was brought to my attention. So I just simply said to them, go after it. The week that the tsunami happened, we had our colleagues here from the Guam Department of Labor. So they had experience with national emergency grants and uh, their assist assistance to us was very valuable. They helped us identify uh, the application, I mean, the terms of the application and the work that was to be done. And early on, it was identifying the requirements for the first component of the grant, which was the creation of jobs, temporary jobs, in direct response to the disaster. The NEG program recruited and employed more than 2,000 people into work crews to do cleanup and recovery all over the island. When they were announcing that they're going to have a cleanup job for, to clean up the village, what was caused by the, what was damaged by the tsunami, so I went in and applied for it. We cleaned up the debris, everything, you know, that we could clean up, we were picking up, doing all the trash, um, dumping them ourselves if we couldn't get anybody to pick them up. And we were trying to make some ways for the, you know, like some roads, back roads to the mountain for like rescue for the people for a tsunami. The availability of, of additional manpower was very helpful and beneficial to the territory in terms of the debris cleanup and the recovery. The grant came in just in, in good timing to help these people rebuild their, uh, their, their spirit and, 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 and getting them back into trying to, to help themselves. I, I think that was the biggest crowd. I'm, I haven't seen for the last how many years that I work for this department to see that many people coming through for help. Uh, it's, it was the most emotion dramatic thing because it was an emergency, they needed help, 
and they came through us, and the money was there to, to help them. So that was the most satisfying thing that I, I, I saw. The Chicken of the Sea fish processing plant was scheduled to close on September 30, but nobody expected a tsunami to strike just one day before and wipe out production, not just in that plant, but also the one next door, the largest, darkest plant. If I had to address the 1,200 jobs that just came to a halt the day after, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to take care of those families in the middle of this recovery effort. That would have been much more devastating to families, villages, and everybody else down the line. Because of the NEG, we avoided that second tsunami. But cleaning up the villages was not enough. The fish processing industry was in shambles. Thousands of people had lost their livelihood. What was needed was a longer-term workforce development strategy. This was a more daunting challenge. There was no industry able to absorb the number of people who needed work. So during its second phase, the NEG program needed to focus on retraining the unemployed workers to help them build new careers. This is the place where I worked before for almost 15 years. So right in front here is where lots of people um, taking breaks for the lunches and eating breakfast and doing smoking outside here and get some fresh air before getting into the place where we used to clean the fish. I used to work here before doing the, where the, house, the warehouse is, but right now it's for the freezer to storage the fish from the boat. When you came to work, it's like a whole family, one whole family in here, hanging around together, happy, doing our job together. It's like a family to me. So every time I'm passing by, it's hard for me to remember, because it's a kind of a old memories from me during the time that I worked here before. So I missed my work and my job. During the Fautasi race, all the workers used to come out here and watch over the sea for the, during the Fautasi race. We're at the racing end, so we used to watch out here instead of going there. They allow us to watch. And also when like this um, big ships coming in, this is where we always up here and take a look at it. The tsunami happened on the 29th of September and the cannery was closed on the 30th of September, the same month. We went to some stores, restaurants, trying to find a job, just filling up applications but they don't give us um, any chances to work. So we just heard the NEG program broadcasting on the television and on the radio, and they have an, an office. So that's where I went and filled a, a paper. Unemployment was skyrocketing. American Samoa's future looked bleak. And yet, in one small village on Tutuila, a top chef was envisioning a future for at least some of those who had lost their jobs. My name is Salua Tupolo and people around here just call me chef. We're in the beautiful island of American Samoa, paradise on the other side of paradise. We're here at the American Samoa Culinary Academy and this is my favorite place to be. Everything around uh, this culture has to do with food. So we just took that whole idea and then started to teach them how to do it professionally. It developed because there was a need to teach people new skills that were affected by the tsunami and then of course the closure of our 
our canneries here. Some of the NEG office called me that there's a school, cooking school, this school, Culinary Academy. They told me if I wanted to join and then any kind of job they can give me or any program, I'll be happy to, to join. I already graduated at the first class. I'm through with this program and Chef Swallow is hiring me to work in this, uh, in this school right now. We wanted to get as many people as we could through, through um, with entry level skills and we, when we took a look at it we said okay let's do a four month program and then during that four month program they actually spent two weeks without even being in the kitchen just in the lecture room learning food safety and sanitation and uh, culinary nutrition and things like that. And then the other three months or so they spent um, rotating from the hot production kitchen to the garmage kitchen, which is cold kitchen, and then of course entry level baking. We have some of the graduating students that uh, that are doing like an apprenticeship, where they do more advanced baking, and then we sell some of the baked goods downstairs in our student bistro, along with uh, sandwiches and soups and small entrees and things like that. But with the funding from the NAG program, um, we were able to actually. Um, put this program together. It, it couldn't happen without it, you know, in terms of the equipment, in terms of this beautiful classroom facility, um, in terms of, uh, um, of the whole program, the financial structure of this program, we wouldn't have been able to do it without the, without the funding from it. I like the place I worked right now. It's a nice place, nice people. Uh, I'm hoping to have a, a bakery store or something like that. I wanted to have my own. I will work hard and looking forward. It's ludicrous to train people for jobs when there are no jobs, but you can train people for jobs if you can identify where those jobs are. And the concept of expanding the village beyond its territorial boundaries to include the entire Pacific, I think provides a, a more realistic perspective on how to solve these kinds of problems and challenges. We are a member of this community. We are a member of Oceania. It makes all the sense to do all that we can to belong to, to that region. And the region is also beginning to research in, uh, in trade and uh, collaboration. Currently, you have to look at uh, what's going on in Guam as the, the big project, not just for American Samoa, but for all of the islands in the Pacific. Billions of dollars are going to be spent there in uh, a, a military buildup to accommodate uh, about 20,000 Marines. And that's going to extend originally over five years. People are saying it's going to go longer to 10 years. So there's long-term employment there and uh, as many as 20,000 additional jobs uh, in that one island alone. We have over the past two, three years developed a regional collaboration with Guam and the Micronesian states. And we hope that, that they too will see American Samoa in the future as perhaps a hub for you know, something that maybe it's a contact center, maybe it's the culinary. But um, it's a great way to kind of leverage in um, the resources and the capabilities that each of the territories have. The U.S. territory of Guam is American Samoa's neighbor some 3,600 miles to the north and across the dateline. Unlike American Samoa, it's experiencing a boom. This need for labor created a perfect job training and placement opportunity for American Samoans. I think it's important for our region to grow together. 
we're all very much interconnected. And when American Samoa suffers a setback, I think we all suffer a setback because no one wants to lose those economic opportunities. So what we do is we try to find the silver lining around that cloud and see how we can turn it uh, into a positive thing. When they come here and they find those jobs and they see that the training opportunities are here and that the construction industry is growing and the demand is there for people who are willing to work hard to provide for themselves and stand on their own two feet, then they're going to, they're going to increase uh, I think their their prospects for the future for their children and grandchildren. You're gonna cut 24 inch piece of lumber. I really need those. We believe that we'll end up with about 90% of the folks that we brought over employed and the whole objective is for them to get the work experience necessary so that the contractors that they are working for, who will also be build, bidding on projects back in American Samoa as their long-term infrastructural plans go, will have an advantage in going back to American Samoa because they can claim they have American Samoa workers. And we can repatriate technology that they have learned here back into American Samoa. We've been hiring consistently since last year. Um, as the project goes into different phases, we hire more. We're bringing on laborers that have never even worked in the construction industry before. So what really appealed to me with the program was that they had those skills in place, that there was kind of the foundation that you need for anybody to come onto a project and have. There's a cultural component of when you leave home in terms of the effects that it has on a young person. Um, we saw it with the military when they left, um, went to boot camp, and they were uh, not completing their boot camp because they were so homesick. By creating support networks through the churches and the communities in different places that are located near an, like an army boot camp site or a, a military installation, um, that has seemed to work well. Well, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's called one lake one my guy on it for some way long. Come on the lake, you see, cut you can't cut you go way long. I don't find the lame most cut you move for say, I delay you going up way long. Little for kill up with that, yeah? I am. Oh, my, look, see, and kiss, little for my. <laughs> yeah. 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 We know that they're going to be living in the dorm and these are adults. We know that we're going to be sending them to the Trades Academy and eventually we know we also need to uh, align them with different employers, right? But at the same time, we were all also very sensitive to uh, their culture, their diet, the food they eat. Uh, we're also very sensitive to make sure that we're, we're filling in, uh, providing that support that they need even spiritually, especially if you're dealing with people who've never been away from their home. The trainees were housed in the Ukutu Workforce Village in northern Guam, where some of them continue to live while they work on construction projects in Guam. Today, they're celebrating their graduation from the program after 90 days of intensive classroom and on-the-job instruction. They are now ready for the jobs that await them.
morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the graduation commencement of the American Samoa National Emergency Grant Program, uh, implemented by the Center for Micronesian Empowerment. At the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it comes down to making a living, providing for yourselves, for your family, for your kids, your mothers and fathers, making sure that there's medicine for your grandparents. These are the things that every community should look out for, and you have done a great job. You are, in fact, proud, and you should be proud. When every island is hit by calamity, whether they're man-made or natural, we all reach out for each other. It doesn't matter where you come from. We honor you, and I am proud to be here. Congratulations. How do you say that in American Samoan? Malo. Malo. Congratulations. Samoans are Polynesians, like many of the Pacific Islands people. We are not individualistic. We are collectivists. We work very well in teams. We understand clans. And work design should be designed around working teams, not individual that work independently from one or another. Because that's the nature of our culture, that's the nature of our history, and that's the nature of what defines us and our successes through time immemorial. Feletti Fatawao is a soft-spoken former rugby player who was looking for work that took him outdoors anything but a desk job. NET was like a window of opportunity for me to, because without NEG, I wouldn't get an opportunity to work in the National Park. The National Park of American Samoa is located on four of the territory's islands, Tutuila, Olosenga, Ta'u and Ofu. We're embedded in the U.S. territory of American Samoa and within the Samoan culture. So our staff is 90% Samoan, and uh, the goal, the long-term goal, is that it's a Samoan park run by Samoans. The work is not easy. Most days, small teams enter the thick rainforest, searching out and removing invasive species, like the Tamalini tree, whose sap destroys the island's famous coral reefs. These invaders are replaced with native trees, such as the Ifilele, that are grown from seedlings and carefully cultivated to maturity. It's exciting because uh, it's like exploring the, the national forest, uh, learning new technology like the TPS and the uh, TPH. Also, you go hike every day up in the steep mountains. Now the park is working with the villages, Pongo Pongo Fangasa, Afono, Vatia, Aua, Atu'u, all the villages that are you know proximate to the park attempting to remove these same three tree species from, from those lands, which are outside of the park. That's why National Park Service employees work directly with Matai leaders to help villagers understand the dangers of invasive species and engage young men to help remove the unwanted plants from village lands. 
You can just see them connecting with, with the land and um, understanding what the national park and what conservation is all about. Together, the NEG program and the National Park Service are growing a cadre of Samoan leaders to build environmental awareness throughout the territory. Filetti is one of those leaders. Today, he heads his own crew. Flag Day is American Samoa's biggest holiday. The day concludes with Fautasi races. These long boats, each with 30 to 40 oarsmen rowing in perfect unison, race into Pango Pango Harbor towards the finish line. Veteran Fautasi rowers say that it is not the raw strength of the team that wins the race, but the degree to which each member of the team is in sync with each other, united by a common purpose. That is the Samoan way where success is not defined by individual prosperity, but by a better future for the family, the village, the island, and for American Samoans wherever they are. The tsunami and its aftermath have changed the island and its people irrevocably. The disaster revealed that the island economy was too fragile and too centered on a single export industry. The tsunami has also had other side effects. It connected American Samoa to its neighbors in the Oceania region and beyond in new ways. American Samoa's story of survival and recovery from a major disaster reveal the modern relevance of this ancient wisdom, which fits so well into a profoundly interdependent contemporary world. That is how it came to be that this small island in the middle of the Pacific has a lesson for the whole Pacific region and the rest of the world. A lesson about how we thrive only in concert with our neighbors, even if they are thousands of miles away. <laughs>